Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Matthew Riviere. I am the current chair of the Emerging Researchers and Aging Group of the British Society of Gerontology, also known as ERA. Um, on today's call, I'm also joined by other ERA committee members, Alison Benzemra, who's the treasurer, Lucy Zabluska, who's the secretary, and Heather Mulkey, who's the incoming chair. Um, for those of you who don't know, ERA provides students, early career academics, researchers, and practitioners with opportunities for learning, networking, and mentor support. We also welcome academics, researchers, and practitioners who are making a mid-career change to aging studies. Um, ERA co-chairs develop pro co-chairs and develops programs and events informed by the suggestions and stated needs of our members. So you all. Um, today, we're delighted to host our last event of 2020, um, which is crafting the next Sterling Prize poster, a digital masterclass with Nadine Mertza. Uh, Nadine Mertza is a fourth year mental, mental health PhD student at the University of Manchester, funded by the Medical Research Council. Her work is on ethnic minorities and dementia, with a specific focus on British South Asians and their access to memory clinics and experience of diagnosis. Her interests include public engagement and science writing, which she channels into blogging for several outlets, including her own blog, The Almost Psychologist. She's been awarded the Sterling Prize for Best Poster twice at the British Society of Gerontology Annual Conference in both 2018 and 2019. Nadine, thank you for joining us today. Please begin when you are ready. Hi, everybody. Thank you for introducing me, Matthew. So I'm really happy to be talking to you guys today about poster presenting and poster designing. But I have to preface my talk by saying that when it comes to poster designing, it, I'm not humble bragging when I say that I'm an absolute amateur when it comes to the design element. Design is not something that comes to me naturally. When it comes to imagining color combinations and layouts, it's not something I can envision in my head. It's something that I go through a lot of trial and error with. And I have made some pretty bad posters in the past. And I'm the type of amateur who does use Microsoft PowerPoint to make their posters. So I'm really sorry, I won't be covering special softwares to make posters, but I will be talking about how to, we can use certain basics and tips and resources to make award-winning posters with PowerPoint. Um, I'll also be talking a bit about um, sort of the elements that kind of go into different types of posters. So I might mention Canva a little bit. I know some people have asked, is Canva something I can make posters on? I don't like to use Canva to make posters just because I don't find the interface very friendly. It's great for flyers and adverts. And I like using it for making little elements for posters like figures and graphs, but I wouldn't use it for an actual poster. Also beforehand, I might make a little reference to the better poster layout, but I will say it does kind of make me a bit nervous. For those of you who don't know what the better poster layout is, it is this idea of restructuring from the traditional poster idea where you have an introduction, a method, a result, a discussion, and kind of having just a big title and then having a little bit about what you actually did. That kind of freaks me out. I'm more of a traditionalist. I like to stick to the traditional format, but still make it very accessible. So I'm going to try and share my screen now and we'll get started with the presentation. Okay. So today I'll first cover just the basics for anyone who's pretty new to poster designing um, or has only really done one or two before, just some beginner's information, that'll be really quick. But then I'll go on to talk about communication, so how important communication within your poster is, selecting and tailoring the content within your poster to be accessible. And then taking that content that you've chosen and designing it and styling it to be something that people want to stop and look at. And finally, I'll speak a little bit about how to use the poster to present with as a tool. Because I know for a fact that when it came to the Sterling Award that I won, they didn't just comment on the poster. 
he spoke a little bit about how I was there standing with the poster and how I spoke to them about it and what other little things I had along with the poster to kind of enhance the experience. I thought the best way I could speak to you about poster designing was to maybe show you examples from my own posters. So there are not so many posters that I've made. These are posters that got, have been rated pretty badly in my past. These are posters I've made in 2016 and 2017. And by the end of this webinar, you'll be able to tear these posters apart and pick out exactly where I went wrong with them. And then these are the posters where I happen to go right. So this poster is the one I won in 2018, and this is the one I won in 2019. Uh, this one was about the influence of culture on cognitive tests. These are tests that we use to diagnose dementia. And I was comparing a test that we use in British Urdu speakers versus Pakistani Urdu speakers. And then the one that we have over here is on a review that I did that was based on barriers and solutions that researchers face when they try to include ethnic minorities in dementia research. So I'm going to be referring to these two posters as well. So let's get started just for some basics. So for anybody who's going to a conference, it's very probable that you're going to have some conference guidelines that you're probably going to have to follow. I know for a fact that when it comes to the British Society of Gerontology Conference and when it comes to the Sterling Award, they do have a set criteria for their posters. All the conferences that I've been to, they've sort of emphasized having an A0 poster. They preferred, you know, having it in a vertical format, which kind of makes sense. A0 is such a big size that having it horizontal would actually be a strain on the eyes looking from left to right. Whereas looking up down, it's very easy on the eyes. And as we go on with the presentation, you'll see how important the flow of eyes is when it comes to posters. Um, in the past, I've always kind of stuck to fabric posters. I feel like they're incredibly easy to travel with. You can just iron them out. You can fold them up. You can iron them out. They're very easy to reuse. Anytime I have used a paper poster, it's kind of torn when I've taken it down. Not very reusable. If you are committed to the idea of using a non-fabric poster, I recommend using matte. Don't go for gloss because you want a poster that people will be able to see from a distance. Gloss is something, you know, with the sheen, you're very likely to have elements of your poster get hidden. When it comes to word count, this is going to be very dependent on whether your study is quantitative or qualitative. So quantitative studies are gonna have very little word count, qualitative a lot more because you're relying on a lot more words. I've seen people say things like, you should only have 250 words total, you should only have 500 words. I can reasonably tell you I've gotten away with 600 to 800 words in my poster. I think 800, more than 800 would be pushing it. Six to 800 is pretty decent though, because it's how you use those words that matter. When it has come to the font sizes, these are the kind of sizes that I like to use. I'm pretty consistent across all my posters. I always stick to these sizes. And I really like to emphasize that within the body, I make all my text the same. So if I want to emphasize a certain point in the text, I don't use size to state that, oh, this point is more important. I use other elements, which I'll be covering today. And just quickly going over font style, don't go for capitals, don't go for underlying, avoid italics as much as possible. The bold can be very good, so using a very nice balance of regular and bold. Stick to sans serif fonts just because they're very clean, they're very modern, and they work if you want to do light font on dark background, and they work for clear headings as well. I really like the font Gisha, I've used it for all my posters. Avoid fancy fonts. So this was a trap that I kind of fell into in this poster. I wanted the idea that I would have a normal font for most of my text, but that my headers could be sort of 
marker handwritten. I thought it was cute. I thought it would look nice, but it became problematic because they became quite difficult to read from a distance. So you might be tempted to do those kind of things, you know, because stylistically they might look good, but as an attendee, they're actually going to be more difficult to read. So I would say stick to sans serif fonts as much as you can. And just quickly wrapping up on the basics, try to make contact information available on your poster. You want to make yourself reachable, even if you are not physically present at your poster. You want to do the work for the attendee as much as possible. For my posters, I've always tried to kind of put an email address, a work phone, and a social media, and a hashtag for my project. I really heavily invested in the branding of my research and I like to put it on my posters. So I put little icons at the very top because it's guaranteed people are going to look at the header of your poster. So even if you can't fit the details there, you can indicate where they can find the details. So I've shown that there's a little arrow, it's pointing downward, and when you go right down to the footer, you can find it. So this is just an important thing, have your contact information available. So that's just some basics. Now, when it comes to poster design, I really think posters straddle this line between communication and design. I have seen these really beautiful, amazingly designed graphical posters that have very complex signs that you know, you're immediately attracted to these posters because of their colors and their layouts. But when you start reading them, you have no idea what they're saying. Similarly, I've seen posters which if the person had been saying the things to me, I would have been like, oh my God, you're so good at science communication. I understand exactly what you're saying. But their layouts and their design has just not worked for me. It is just not an eye-capturing poster. I can honestly say that in my experiences with the Sterling Award, I sometimes thought that there were other posters that were visually a lot more beautiful than mine. And I think what tipped me over the edge was maybe where I might have been lacking in design, I made up for in communication. So I think you need to be a jack of all trades here. You need to balance your science communication skills with your design elements. And firstly, that means never use a standard poster template. I know sometimes universities offer standard poster templates. Don't do it. Your research is unique. The elements that you choose to showcase, and I'm going to talk a lot about how you do this, are going to be very unique. So a standard poster template is not going to work for you. You need to work from scratch. So with communication, first you need to decide how you're going to convey your information. Who is the audience? Everyone always says, you know, always think about your audience when you're presenting, when you're communicating science. The thing is, when it comes to a poster, we have this assumption that we're going to an academic conference. Our audience is other scientists, so we can get away with talking about jargon, mentioning a lot of, you know, scientific terms. I would personally not do that. I, I am a qualitative researcher. I work in health services research in dementia. When I go to dementia related conferences, I see a lot of posters that are related to treatment and drug trials and clinical trials and things like that. And the posters have a lot of jargon and a lot of acronyms and I don't understand any of it because even though I'm a dementia researcher, that specialized stuff has nothing to do with me. So I see that information and I immediately, I don't zone out, but I kind of freak out because I don't understand what any of it is. So don't assume that just because your audience is researchers, they're gonna know. Screen out the jargon, screen out the acronyms. And I particularly say acronyms because I feel that even if you explain acronyms in the text of your poster, as people read your poster, they might forget what the acronym is. And unless that acronym is in the title, they're gonna hate to have to keep going back and seeing what does this acronym stand for? So try to avoid having a lot of acronyms in your poster. 
you also when you explain what's going on in your poster, you want to go from broad to narrow. You want to explain concepts broadly and go narrow. So I'll kind of explain what I mean by that. So here's just an example from one of my posters. So the narrow point is that ethnic minorities are underrepresented in UK-based dementia research. That's my narrow point right there. But I start off by first talking about the fact that there are a lot of ethnic minorities in the UK. A lot of them are getting older. They're very susceptible to dementia. Why are they susceptible to dementia? And then mentioning the problem. I've narrowed it down to the problem. And I think that's the kind of approach we need to have in our introduction sections. We've got to narrow it down by starting broad. I've done that similarly over here. So this was my one about culture influencing cognitive assessments. First, I've talked about what a cognitive assessment is, what do they assess? And very simply, it's only taken a sentence or two. I've talked about the ways that they influence culture and then gone on to how this causes problems, then about the specific assessment that I focused on, then the population I focused on. So again, narrowing down. And you'll note that I used bullet points. I abhor using paragraphs in posters. I used to do it, I don't do it anymore. I don't think you should. I think paragraphs are essentially a wall of text and they cause people to walk away from your poster. Use bullet points. They are clear, they're concise, they force you to be concise. And they add a bit of color to an otherwise sort of blank wall of text. They help you space out. This is just easier on the eyes of your viewer. So um, another thing that you can do when you're trying to explain something, trying to include elements of science communication is to make your poster interactive. Now I don't mean buttons and things, but try to almost have a conversation with your audience. So for example, when it came to explaining the influence of culture on cognitive tests, I actually sort of popped in a little example just to kind of demonstrate how this can happen. I kind of popped it in like, look, this is an example of a cognitive test question. There's a kangaroo. When I did you know, a group with British South Asians, over half of them did not know what this kangaroo was. And right there and then they understand what the problem is. They've already grasped it just by this poster. They read this part, they see the little picture of the pig. They read this description about how participants did understand what the pig was, but they found the image offensive. Right there and then they also understand that culture isn't just about understanding things. It's also about things that are acceptable and things that can be offensive. So by the time they've reached, I would say less than a quarter of my poster, they've understand a pretty crucial concept that is needed to understand the rest of the poster. Another thing you can do is incorporate questions. Questions force your attendee to stop and think, unconsciously or consciously, about the question you've asked. So in the barriers and solutions poster, I had the questions posed that if you don't you know, recruit ethnic minorities to research, the research won't be designed for them, and how will you ever answer questions about with regards to how do you recruit people to the research if they're stigmatized? What if the population doesn't speak the same language? How can we conduct research in a population with no word for dementia? These are some of the problems we face, but instead of stating them as sentences, I pose them as questions because I feel that might make an attendee ask, oh wait, this might be something worth thinking about. So, You've gone and you've gone through the content of what of the study that you want to turn into a poster and you've made it really audience friendly, really science friendly. What are you trying to convey at the end of the day to your poster? What is the audience actually going to care about? The thing is, you are not doing an oral presentation. Your attendee is not obligated to sit through your entire poster, right? It's not like an oral presentation where they usually sit through the entire talk and wait for the take home message. They're there, they're there for 30 seconds, they're out. That means that not all information is equal. 
you are going to have to decide which information you want to convey, which information matters. This is usually going to be your aims or your findings because your aim is telling you what you were looking for. So they might be interested. What was this person looking for? Or what did this person find? Findings. They're not going to be that bothered about how you found it or what this means for future research in the area unless they are fair, unless they're assessing your poster or they're, you know, as specifically in the area as you are. And these are going to be the people who stop and have a chat with you. But for the general sort of attendee, they're just going to care about what you found, what you were looking for, what you found. And even when it comes to their findings, they're not going to care about all of your findings. You're going to be, have to be very judicious about your findings. So for example, when I was presenting the barriers that researchers face recruiting ethnic minorities, and the sort of solutions, I had several teams, several, you know, some related to community education, some related to health services, some related to the actual researchers. And I figured I'm at a conference for researchers. They're probably going to care more about the teams that are related to them, less about these. So it might be a good idea to just briefly mention these, but elaborate more on these. You know, I'm working with very limited real estate. So I got to prioritize what my attendee is going to care about. So they're only going to care about some of the findings, possibly the findings that relate to them. So that is what I'm going to focus on. That's what I'm going to elaborate on. When it comes to your methods and discussion, that is going to be the section that they care about the least. So you could possibly get away with writing just a few sentences. Some people write one sentence on their method. Some people scrap methods altogether. It's up to you. It's up to you depending on how important your methods were to your findings. You know, is your method something you want to be talking about? Something like that, that's for you to consider. And this is why I said you can't really use a template. It's gonna be very unique to you what you decide to showcase in your poster. The introduction is going to be very variable. So, you know, it depends. Is it very important for the person to understand some background concepts to understand your research? If so, yes, your introduction is going to take a big portion. If it's not very important, if it's just going to be, a, you know, introduction is so basic that most people at the conference would probably know, you could probably get away with a few sentences. That is gonna be, again, up to you. How much do you need to explain to your audience? Again, use bullets. You absolutely do not need to be using paragraphs. You can get away with using bullets. They're palatable, they're digestible, they're easy to read. I have a very clear headline-esque title. So what I mean by that is, so my poster did not do so well. This was the title. Now, at the time, I didn't think this title was problematic. I didn't think there were words in it that were very difficult. But I can say that even if they're not very difficult words in it, even though there are, for example, this, the Aiden Brooks Cognitive Examination, just because I know what a cognitive examination is, doesn't mean everyone does. This could mean anything to a lot of people. I take for granted that a long-winded title like this could put off a lot of people. It might be, you know, I can honestly say there have been so many times where I've read the title of a poster and it was just so long I walked away. You are working with very limited attention spans. So it's a good idea to maybe have a bigger main title that very clearly states what the poster is gonna be about and then just have your academic title as a subheading. Or if you can, you know, if your main title is really very to the point. So these were the posters that worked out. Very simple, very to the point titles. So this was all about communication and making your poster accessible. But now that you have the content, what do you do with it? you now have to design the poster. You have to showcase it. You have to basically facilitate the natural eye flow while still halting it in its tracks. 
So you have to make the eye flow easy, and graceful, while still stopping like, oh my God, this is beautiful. I want to stop and I want to look at this. I felt like when we're talking about a general poster, there are three basic elements, the layout or the way you locate the information, the boundaries or the way you space out the information, and then the color or the way you're highlighting the information. So let's talk about layout first. I feel like layout is a huge struggle. I definitely struggle with layout. This is just one example of where my layout was all over the place. When you look at it, there is no focal point. There is no natural flow for the eyes. You know, you're going down like this, and then are you supposed to read this first? Are you supposed to read this first? It's, it, your eyes are all over the place. The images, which should have been the highlight, are way too low. And the most important thing is basically not being showcased. Because what I tried to do here was, I tried to give all my information equal amount of space. When, like I said, not all information is equal. I should have been more judicious. So when it comes to posters, so these are the you know, areas I could have, I could have essentially scrapped this table and I'll talk about why later on. This I could have shortened the method section. I could have made this a lot smaller, limited it to a lot less, in, less information because at the end of the day, no one's gonna care about all these little steps I took. So when it comes to the essential layout, you have the options, you know, columns or rows. And I will talk about the pros and cons, but at the end of the day, whether you have columns or rows, your eyes are going to fall on the center initially. That's where eyes fall. So it's a good idea to keep in mind when you're designing a poster that you want your aims or your findings or the piece that you want to showcase to fall in this center. This could sometimes mean that, you know, for example, if we were going with the rows, you could have your introduction here. You could have your aim here. You could actually dare to have your findings over here. And then have your method and discussion here. So you don't, so that's why I said, you know, I'm a bit of a traditionalist, but I don't mind kind of circumventing the order of things. Your method doesn't have to come before your findings. You could tell them what you found before telling them how you found it. So as long as you understand that this center is your sweet spot, you want to fill it up. So just as an example, my posters, when we look at their center, with this one, immediately my findings are in the center. That's excellent. With this one, most of my findings made it to the center. So I'm quite pleased about that. At least half of them made it to the center. So that's good. This is an example of where it, it kind of matched up and that's, that's quite important. So when you have that in mind, okay, I wanna get my information in the center. Now, should I go columns? Should I go rows? With columns, I feel like they look very clean cut, but I feel like you're limited to two. More than two looks, it gives the illusion of crowding because they become a bit too slim. Then your sentences become kind of crowded looking. So you end up with just two columns. Whereas with rows, you can kind of have an unlimited number of rows and your columns have to be equal width, but your rows can be random heights and they'll still look good. Row, uh, columns can be very good for quantitative research, I think. And they can be very good when you have multiple figures and graphs. Uh, you can distribute them and I'll mention how in a bit. But I feel like rows, they give you a little bit more freedom. They work really good for qualitative research because they give you more focus on the findings in the center. And they're really good for when you lack figures. So whereas I feel columns kind of demand a figure or two, rows, not so much. So just as an example, this is a bit of a quantitative layout in columns. And as you can see, I've kind of imagined that this might be the aim. So it's right in the center. 
And I've kind of symmetrically framed it. So you could have a figure down here and then a figure up here, and you've kind of framed this aim in the center. And this has worked in the concept of, you know, having more than one figure and having two columns. In qualitative, which is what mine was, so mine was qualitative, but I managed to pull it off with two columns. It was useful because I dedicated literally a whole column to my introduction. So going back to if you are the type of person, if your study needs that heavy introduction to explain concepts like I needed to explain culture and so, having columns is a good idea because you can have this nice, big, undisrupted section and it's not gonna look like a big chunk of wall the way a row might look. So, this is an example if you were doing quantitative with a row. So this looks good if you have just the one figure and you make that one figure your central focus and then have a little description. Having more than one figure is gonna make this area look clutter. So really only stick to one figure. For qualitative, this is again, like I mentioned, a really great way to focus on central findings, good for figures related to qualitative research. And I feel like with rows, towards the end, when you kind of get to the discussion and references section, you can get away with splitting it into two columns because people are gonna be more focused on this area anyway. They'll be less jarred by this kind of disruptance. So just to kind of show you how you can use columns within rows. So I wouldn't, you can't really use rows within columns, if that makes sense, but you can use columns in rows to create sections and subsections. So like I mentioned, I have this poster, right? I have given findings, the majority of the space, and I've given my aims a very prominent section. So when we say seven different sections, we see that, you know, I've prioritized certain information above certain information, unequal distribution. And these are all in rows. But if we look at my finding section, they have subsections that I've split off into two columns. So this can be done very nicely. If you do it in a very artful way, you can have columns within rows. And I think it looks really beautiful for the structure of findings. Maybe not so much for methods. I think it's best used for background and for findings. Then there are some slightly more, you know, new and conventional kind of layouts. So again, we have this concept that as long as you focus on the center, you should be fine. The concept of using circular images can be very good for qualitative, for example, themes, sub-themes, because it's been proven that the circular image is very pleasing for the eye. Similarly, if you have a huge image maybe related to your research, maybe work that you've done with your participants, you can showcase that and have little bits of text and just have the main study elements up here. Again, as long as these are your central focus they should look absolutely fine. So, little points when it comes to the layout, you wanna make your reader's life easier. I know that already, you know, you've given them this structured layout, but your reader is gonna be at your poster for less than a minute. They need to speed read. Anything you can do to speed that process up is good. Give every section a little header number every single header. So there isn't even a doubt from which header to which header you need to go to and give the aim its own section. I think when the aim isn't disguised in the introduction and it has its own prominent section, it becomes very clear what the poster is about. People become less confused about what they should be reading about in your poster. So we've talked about layout. So you've decided that, for example, you know, you want to do columns, you want to do this, 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 but how are you going to arrange your different blocks? How should you space them out? 
People say that you should have negative space, so space that contains absolutely nothing. And that space should be at least 30%. I'm a big fan of negative space, but I can tell you I have never calculated how much negative space I've used. I just know that I like to keep margins of at least one inch around the entire poster. And then equal spaces between the sections of about between half an inch to an inch. And I think it makes your poster look very clean cut. You don't need to have sections pressing in close together. And in fact, if you have been very judicious about the information that you've selected, you shouldn't need to press sections together. You should have a lot of nice negative space. And then how you kind of section those sections off, you don't have to have thick lines. You could use, so I like to use dots, colored dots. I like to use curved edges. I feel like they look a little bit more editorial than pointed edges. I like even my headings. I try to give them a little bit of a curve. I feel like it looks just a little more appealing. It looks slightly more like you put a little effort into the design. So those are little things that you can do to kind of make your sections a little more appealing. And then color. Color is a huge thing that I have struggled with. Color is, you know, I cannot imagine in my head, I have to see the colors on the poster to understand whether it looks good or not. And to understand the color, it is good to understand some elements of the color wheel. So for example, understanding what shades are. So different kind of versions of the same color would be shades. To understand what tints are. So when we look at the color wheel, Everything in the same ring would be one tint. So these are all dark tints. Everything inside, these are all light tints. And then of course, complementary colors. So colors that are on opposite sides of the color wheel. Color wheel is something obviously you can easily Google. And it is important in understanding the color wheel because it gives you an idea of firstly, what not to do. Don't use shades of one color. I know that for presentations, shades of one color can be really great. And it might feel like it is a natural theme, but shades of one color are going to fade your poster out. They're gonna make your poster kind of disappear and look more white. You don't wanna be using shades of one color. Similarly, you don't wanna use colors of a light tint. It's gonna give you that same kind of fade out effect. And my poster suffered. I used colors of a very light tint and my poster was not striking, it did not, you know, strike out to people. It wasn't something that they could see from afar or notice. You want to use complementary colors. So these are examples of complementary colors that look beautiful on posters. This, this, and you'll see this is, this is one that I like to use, my university colors. Complementary colors go really well together. But the best thing is to use at least three colors. So for my posters, so two of the colors will be two very dominating colors and one will be an accent color or a highlighting color. So for example, I have my poster from the color wheel. We can see that I have these two colors, which were their complementary colors and they take huge precedence over the poster. They're very prominent in the poster, but in little places, I have this little accent color that I've used in little places to kind of you know, give a little bit of a pop. How you can make these colors, you know, if it's not something that comes naturally to you, you there are a lot of online portals and palette areas. They generate palettes for you. One is called Material Palette. I really like it. It was recommended by Dr. Tulio Rossi, and he actually wrote an excellent blog post on poster design. And it was his blog post that I followed when I first wanted to understand really good poster design. And well, he said how to design an award-winning poster and I won an award. So, I mean, it, it, it is as advertised. And he's now actually developed a course on good poster designing. So I would really recommend it. But he said to use material palette. So you can input one color or two colors and it'll give you a whole palette of, you know, dominant colors, accent colors, colors for fonts, 
and you have a whole selection here and you can play around with palettes. That way you are gonna have a very eye popping poster. And then you have to get creative with the colors once you've chosen them. How are you gonna use them to you know, section your poster off? So for example, when it came to the purple and yellow, in the main context, I use the yellow for the background. I really think having a background color is way better than having a white color. Every time I've used a white color, I've kind of felt like my poster has faded out. Every time I've used a color in the background, my poster has popped out and has definitely been more vocal. So I used the yellow as a background color, and then I had purple as my borders and my aim. So that was the main purpose of my colors. But when I wanted to go deeper and I wanted to go into highlighting and representation and sectioning off, we can see, for example, on this level, I've used the yellow to represent methods and the purple to represent results. And then in my finding section, I've used purple to represent one theme, the green to represent another theme, yellow to represent another theme. So it's just kind of understanding where you can use color to highlight different things. And this is what I was talking about when I said that you don't need to use font size to emphasize certain things. You use things like location and color to do that for you. Then apart from location, boundaries, and color, there are individual little elements you can do to kind of take your poster over the edge. So for example, one thing that I'd originally been criticized on very randomly was that sometimes people didn't know who the speaking author was. So I just started making my name bold. It was something that people immediately guessed, oh, this must be the speaker. I also tried to have a bit of a theme. So I kind of stuck to my university colors. I thought it was nice. Um, also our university symbol, University of Manchester, it's, you know, we're big on the B. I had the little honeycomb shapes. I thought, you know, it was cutesy and it kind of worked. So, you know, a bit of a theme going on. Other little elements I had just made, again, my reader's life a bit easier. So for example, I had these little steps for my methods and my search results. I only had these steps, but I added arrows just because I wanted to make it very clear that these steps are not independent steps. They are dependent on each other. One step follows the other. And so there's no second guessing for my reader. And I've also labeled them with letters because I didn't use numbers because my headers were already using numbers. So I had to use another labeling category. And then why label them at all? Because if someone did happen to chat to me about my poster and I want to talk about some, I can easily say, oh, well, if you look at section E, it says, and it just makes talking about your poster a little bit easier. When it comes to other little elements in your poster, there's a bit of a hierarchy. So text provides the most information, but attracts the least attention. And then when you go up, images provides the most attention, but the least information. You wanna have a nice little balance and usually posters kind of straddle the line with bullets and figures. That's the best thing you can do. Figures would include charts, graphs, histograms, but not tables. Don't include tables because usually tables have a lot of extraneous information that your attendee is not going to be interested in. And the bits that they are interested in can usually be summarized in the form of a sentence or a histogram. You don't really need to be putting in tables at all. So images can also include icons. So and I'll talk a little bit about that over here. So because of my nature of my research, I don't have any images, I don't have any graphs, I have to rely on things like icons. So for example, I had little images that I use for cultural references, and just, you know, making their borders uniform, making their size uniform <laughs> makes a huge difference. I had to denote the different types of questions. So Pakistani test question versus British test questions. I decided to use little flag icons. 
instead of randomly picking pictures of the flags, I went with uniform images. Uniformity can do a lot for your poster. So pick uniform icons, pick a uniform style, angle them uniformly like I've done over here. Similarly over here, to denote my teams, I had these little stick men represent the different teams. They all came in the same creative commons and they're all uniform, same kind of style. It just looks good to have that little uniformity. So from all the basic information that I just kind of gave you, I'm just gonna very quickly, cause we're very close to wrapping up, just show you some posters and hopefully now you'll be able to see and quickly identify some of the pros and some of the cons. So for example, this poster. I saw this poster and I was very interested in the subject. Immediately, pros that I noticed. Very clear title. The information that it goes from broad to narrow, it's written in layman terms. It's written in bullets. The sections are labeled. It's got a separate aim, immediately I see that aim. And the results are in the center and the colors in the figure have been connected to teams. So I immediately know that. So accessibility wise, excellent. Communication wise, excellent. I know what this poster is telling me, but I would say design wise, poster lacks negative space. Um, spacing is very poor. The hard boundaries, they could have been stylized. There's no numbering on the sections. There's no flow. It's almost like they're blocks. Your eye flow goes everywhere uneven lines in the figure, there's no color scheme, there's just shades of orange, there's cramp logos, random insertion of the flag. I mean, I'm Pakistani, love a Pakistani flag, but I think it could have been done a bit better. No images or icons were used to kind of enhance attention. So these are pros and cons showing communication versus design. Another example, I thought this poster was once again, very clear broad to narrow information, layman talk, results straight smack in the center, and they made good use of images, which as we know, attracts attention. And they used quotes, which will immediately tell someone about what's going on. But cons, the introduction could be more persuasive with the use of bullets and points that kind of capture the audience's attention more. They haven't numbered their sections the spacing is uneven, there's inconsistent formatting of the pictures, this one has a border, this one doesn't, there are hard borders, the table is a bit unnecessary, there's unnecessary centering of the references, the references are not important, you could have had conclusions or implications in here, or you could have had the method here and expanded on introduction over here, they've used one shade of color instead of having a color palette, and they haven't made their quotes stick out in any way. The quotes are blending in when in fact, I would say the quotes are probably the most important thing about this poster. This poster was actually the one that I thought was gonna win in 2018 and came second and was a runner up. And I really, really like this one. It grabs your attention, it, you know, it's interactive. It lets you play with it. This was interactive. You can actually touch this and make a circuit or something. Um, so it was, it was very beautiful and no surprise, the person actually had experience with graphic design, but there was, I think some, you know, bit of a lack of a clear flow. I didn't know where my eyes were supposed to go to first. And I couldn't find a separate aim over here that told me exactly what I should be looking for, but still a very wonderful poster. And just quickly wrapping up. This was the original version of my 2019 poster, which I think if I look back now with the things that I've learned, I immediately can notice the pros and the cons. So I can see, yeah, I had a clear title and communication wise, I was on board. You know, I had my bullets and results in the center and everything, separate icons, but the cons were pretty heavy. My color palette is very dull. It's mostly shades of yellow. The aim is hidden away. I had a separate section for an aim, but it's white. I didn't color it. I didn't make it stick out. Too much space was given to the methods. I should have made certain information more important than others. I shouldn't have tried to equally distribute real estate. 
the results got pushed down because of this. And I used a very severe font. It's not a very friendly font. It looks like a very authoritative font, if that makes sense, very straight edged. I should have used an easily readable font, not something where the letters are so close together. And it's a good thing I did change it because the poster that I ended up with ended up being far more friendly and colorful and eye-catching. So quickly wrapping up, once you do end up with a poster that you feel balances science communication and design, use it as a tool. Do not read your poster as you are talking to people about it. You should have that poster memorized. You should be like a weather woman who can gesture at a green screen without looking at it. You should know exactly where each element of the poster is and you should simply use it as a tool to enhance what you're talking about. Stand a bit away from your poster during the session. I know that you should be there for people who want to speak to you, but I think keep a little bit of distance because people are actually going to be less likely to want to come to your poster if they feel like you're going to hover over them. Instead, keep a bit of distance. If you see them standing there for a little more than 30 seconds to a minute, then approach them and ask them if they have any questions, what they think about it, because by then you can tell they're interested in that. Handouts. Absolutely have a little plastic envelope of handouts sticking out. Hand them out to people as they come, whether they ask for it or not, just give it out. Have a space, I would say, to take and leave cards and make it very clear what this space is for. I feel like people see this as a way to interact. They might not even be interested in your poster. They might just want to leave their card but it gets them to your poster and they might stop and they might take a handout because of it. And you might make a useful connection because of this. And promote your poster on social media. Let people know you are gonna be available at this number. Let people know what time you're gonna be available. Tell them you're even willing to answer their questions on social media if they tag your hashtag, if they're not willing to maybe talk to you in person because maybe they can't make it or maybe they just don't feel up to speaking to you in person. So thanks so much for listening. I hope this was a good sort of introduction and guide to the basic elements of good poster design and gave you an insight into how I've managed to kind of produce posters.